Hey everybody, this is Erica the Technology Nerd who likes to film stuff and today I have the Nexus 4 unboxing. This just came in the mail. Happy New Year's everybody! So it is New Year's Eve right now and this just came to my door. So today I want to unbox this, talk about some initial reactions to the phone, and then I want to do some speed tests. Actually, I've got a T-Mobile SIM card and an AT&T SIM card, and then I've been hearing about the CPU GPU throttling and I want to do some tests there, some benchmark tests against something like my Galaxy Note 2 or my Galaxy S3 and see how it performs once it starts to heat up. So without much further ado, let's go ahead and open it. Nexus 4. This stupid phone that is so elusive that no one's ever seen it, actually, in real life, besides maybe on reviews. So Google claims that this is the best of Google. The first thing I'm going to say, first off, is that I think this product was made as a rush product to get out before the holidays, so I think LG might have manufactured it a little bit cheaply. We will get into that. So here is the sleeve. It does have quite nice of a presentation, actually. Nice sleeve. Followed by a nice papery black box and there seems to be some water or something on my counter. Oh well. And it's held together by this tape here. So, got some various things, product description, SKU, UPC, IMEI. Got Nexus. The box feels very nice. It's kind of a matte finish. Oh, so we've got some nasty scissors here. Go ahead and cut through that tape. Dude. Uh, that never looks very nice. Maybe I should have used a blade. Aha! Success! Oh, it's the scissors that are wet. Uh, alrighty, we're gonna go ahead and open this now. And there it is, sitting there. Looks nicely presented in its little box here. My initial impression of the weight is that it feels pretty, it's not heavy, but it is hefty at least. It doesn't feel that it's so light that it's cheap. We've got some protective coverings on the back here. There's this piece of plastic that is protecting the glass. I think I'm going to leave that on there actually. It's quite convenient. It's not something that looks like it's going to come off easily. We're going to go ahead and take off this front screen protector here. It does indicate that there is the power button. You've also got your volume rocker switch, you know, plus and minus. Oh, doesn't want to come off. Oh, oh, ah, there we go. Aha! You've got a SIM card tray here, and you've got a really teeny little pin, it looks like, to help push that out. This phone seems to be held together only by these two screws and probably some adhesive. I am tempted to take this apart after the Galaxy S3, and I've been hearing that this is incredibly easy to take apart, so I might just do that. You've got a microphone here at the bottom. You've got your micro USB port. Let's see what else have we got? You've got a headphone jack here, and you've also got another microphone, and you've got back facing camera. So let's go ahead and turn this puppy on. Oh, don't forget your front receiver. I am curious about this screen because I have heard that it's actually not very well calibrated, if at all. So eh, I'll have to be as honest as possible. Here's some squabbling downstairs. My family, they're lovely. So I do like how this feels in hand though. This actually is quite nice. I do wish that the back were more of a rounded feeling rather than the flat, but that might be because of my bias towards the Galaxy S3 playing with that and really liking how that feels, but it feels pretty nice in hand actually. English, United States, start. Oh, SIM card. So I'm assuming that in this box there is some type of SIM tool to eject that. This is anything in here? No, I think that's just decorative to hold it in place. We've got a quick start guide, which I will not be looking at. Oh, here we are. This is the SIM eject tool. Ah, but you've also got a charger and your micro USB cord here and uh, nothing else in the box. No earphones! Disappointing! Now let's see if I can't get this ejected with this tiny SIM tool. Be quiet, Note 2! Here we go. That actually popped out not too difficult. Yeah, so this is for a micro SIM, and I have my T-Mobile SIM card on hand. 
Actually, I prefer to start out with the T-Mobile SIM card because this is a dual carrier modem in this phone, which means on T-Mobile, you know, other carriers that have dual carrier, is that you're actually combining bandwidth from two cell towers and it becomes a lot faster than you get on just regular HSPA+. So it's not 4G LTE, but it does get you 4G theoretical speeds about 42 megabits per second down. Now I don't know about the upstream antenna, so I'm going to have to test that out as well. Hmm. Doesn't like me. Maybe this way? Yes, go this way. Ta-da! That's nice and firm in place. Hmm. See, now I'm wanting to go backward, but uh, it only gives me the option to skip and it's not reading the SIM card right away. I like having actual capacitive buttons. I don't like it when I only have a screen. My Wi-Fi, I've called Fuzzy Lumps, because I'm weird. Gotta put my password in. Ah, that was pretty quick. Now I gotta set up all my Google stuff. I guess, sure, whatever, I'll go ahead. One thing that I'm finding awkward here at first is that I don't really like that placement of the keyboard. You can see that it's a little bit choked up. I'd expect it to be down just a tad bit further. But if I push this down arrow, arrow because there aren't any menu buttons, it just gets rid of it altogether. So that's uh, kind of weird to have to choke up just a bit, but people who have bigger hands probably aren't going to notice that. I do notice that the vibrating module inside the phone gives a really nice haptic feedback. It's not too strong and it's not too loud, so that's kind of perfect. Now I'm restoring my Google account. So make yourself at home. You can put your favorite apps here. Yeah, that's what I really like about the new Jelly Bean is that you can put apps right here on your unlock screen. And I have that on my Nexus 7 and I have found it to be quite functional, so I'll be going through that as well, probably in another video, talking about how I really like the updates. While playing with this, the first thing I notice is that it tends to get warm quite fast, especially through that glass you can feel in the back there. As far as screen calibration, my worries do come true. It, uh, is the greens don't look quite right and the whites are the whites are quite off. I think that uh, the whites look more... Eey, I, don't, I don't know how you would describe that. It is quite sharp though, and that is really nice. So it is now upgrading to Android 4.2.1, and as it's doing that, I've been holding it a little bit more. I notice that this is a soft touch type plastic, and actually I appreciate how that feels in the hand because it doesn't feel like I'm going to drop the phone. So that, uh, that is a nice feature. Some people don't like the fact that this is plastic and they feel that it takes away from the phone, makes it feel cheaper. But actually I feel that it's making it less slippery with that soft touch. So my question is, how easily does this scratch up and how much do you have to worry? Keys are soft though in terms of most scale of hardness. It's a scale of mineral hardness to see what would actually scratch thing like glass which has a hardness of about seven even gorilla glass my one worry would be if I were to drop this phone of course this is gonna shatter right away I don't know if any of you have seen my gorilla glass truth of gorilla glass video on my channel where I torture a Galaxy S3 screen that had a broken well touchscreen controller so the digitizer didn't work yeah I'm expecting this to crack very easy if you should drop your phone if you put it on a table and there's any type of grit, this is going to scratch up like crazy, just like your screen will. Grit being sand particles, because sand will scratch Gorilla Glass like crazy. Metals won't, sand will. I think that speaker placement is a bit unfortunate because I'm holding it in my hand as if I would do with my phone, reading it with my left hand. And you can hear that I'm listening to a song right now, but uh, when I move my hand... You see that I, it is very easy to cover up that speaker. Becomes muted very easy, so that's, uh, that's something that is a little bit interesting. And that's due to the fact that this is flat, so if you're holding it flat in your hand, you can expect your palm to block that speaker a little bit, so that's something I notice as well. One thing that bothers me seems to be the banding in this display. This is a gradient. It's going from white, essentially, all the way down to black. And I can see that there are some blues in here. There's an interesting band of green, and it seems to not be uniform in its entirety. The color seems to change a lot. So I'm going to be checking that out and seeing how that affects different images, especially in terms of when watching darker movies. So I'm a little bit curious about that. 
instead it goes suddenly darker, then lighter, then darker, then lighter. Uh, so this is, this is curious. Francois, what do you think about this? I had a chance to actually go and look at a little bit at what's going on with this display and it isn't very pretty. It looks like as if it were almost intentional. I will get into that in my full review, but the response is weird. You can see that there's a lot of compression artifacts that become obvious that really should not be there. This is in black and white, and now I'm seeing blue, I'm seeing gray, I'm seeing things that I don't see in a properly calibrated display with proper response. So I don't know what they did. I don't know why they did this. But if you are playing games or you're watching movies, sometimes it looks like it's clipping or it's banding and there's colors that really should not be there and it doesn't look very nice. Woohoo! This is the initial speed tests on T-Mobile in my house with pretty bad reception. You can see that I've only got one bar. It's clinging to life there. And with that dual carrier modem in there, I've got a download speed of about 7 megabits per second. Now let's try that again. Here we go. Ooh! Look at that! That's 8 megabits per second down and upload. You can see upload is really struggling there. It, it really sucks. So your download with this phone for dual carrier, if you have a dual carrier network like T-Mobile, you're going to get some really nice LTE looking speeds. I can't object to having at least 8 you know, megabits per second down. That's really not bad considering I'm used to having speeds on HSPA Plus that are, you know, three, sometimes two, sometimes below one on AT&T. So let's go ahead and get the AT&T SIM card and see what happens with that. So now we're going to switch T-Mobile to AT&T. So you can see that I actually have a nano SIM here in a micro SIM adapter. So we're gonna see if that will be okay and actually fit into this phone. So this feels a little bit scary, but you can see I've got it in there somewhat inserted. Let's see if it'll go in without any issue. And it does, so that's that's promising. So if you need to use any type of adapter, it looks like it will do just fine in this phone, which is very important to nerds like me who are switching out into something like the Note 2 or the iPhone 5, hence the Nano SIM. So not too bad, but how about uh, how about taking it out? That kind of makes me a wee bit paranoid. Okay, eh. so far so good. Yeah, no problem, actually. So, just make sure that it's seated correctly, of course, before putting it in so it doesn't choke upward. As you can see, it is now coming out of the tray. So just make sure it's seated correctly by holding your thumb at the corner and push inward. There you are. Again, people are sitting so loud. So sorry. So let's see if that's actually recognized now. Sim removed. Oh, hmm, okay. When you remove the SIM, it actually makes you restart the phone. That's curious. That doesn't happen on my uh, Samsung phones or my iPhone. Sweet, AT&T is now the registered network. Let's go ahead and do another speed test. And actually, the reception looks like it's better in my house for AT&T as on T-Mobile, it was only one bar. And it was actually still impressive speeds, even for terrible reception, so I can only imagine what it would be like outside my house. Begin test. Start going. Don't have all day getting old here. It's going to be 2013 before you start. Hurry up. There we go. And you're seeing that I'm getting about maybe a megabit per second down. Oh, wait. Download speed. That can't be right. It says zero megabits per second. Okay, fine. Let's do a web speed test then. Just seeing how it works because the UCLA speed test is saying it's got zero megabits per second down. I, I don't I don't know. Hot chocolate. That actually was not too bad. Pumpkins. It's really not slow at all. It's okay. So apparently it's not the phone. It's got to be something going on with the phone and not liking speed test at this moment. Amazon? Oh, that's, that's plenty fast. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I am sitting in bed now, but I am still observing this phone and having a chance to play with it a little bit more today. 
What I am really liking is the aspect ratio of the screen. It's not a 16:9 aspect ratio. It is a little bit wider on this display as some other Android phones that I've been playing with lately. But I really like this because it just feels so much more expansive, especially when you're looking at web pages. You can see so much more across the width of the display. Now when you're watching videos or if you are looking at pictures, you do get some black bars and that can be a little bit annoying. But at the same time, I am really appreciating having that greater space on the display. It's a nice welcome back. I had it with my other Galaxy Nexus. The interface is incredibly snappy. That is another thing to point out is that I have truly have not played with another Android phone that was this snappy. I've been fascinated by my Galaxy Note 2 because it's so fast with that 1.6 gigahertz Exynos processor, but this is even faster than that. This is wonderful. I think the reason probably just to buy this phone alone is if you want the closest to an iPhone 5 experience possible with Android operating system. There is nothing that I've seen that is more smooth than this. So I've now made a couple of phone calls and it actually isn't too bad. I've heard it being much more of a nightmare than it really is. I haven't had any trouble hearing. I talked to my grandma. I didn't have any trouble with her on the other line and she could hear me just fine. It's not super beautifully crystal clear, but it's okay, honestly, in comparison to other phones. So it's not something that I am so worried about. Now, as far as audio and speaker quality, I've been hearing nightmares about the Nexus 4. People saying it's so cheap, it sounds awful. Well, for my unit, it it's not that bad, actually, so I'm wondering if there's been some improvements made since release. I haven't had any issues with distortion or crackling or anything like that. Granted, it could be louder, such as on speakerphone, but it's not the initial nightmare that I've been hearing about. It's not the greatest speaker, but it's really not that bad at all. The part that people really struggled with was when you had earphones in, they would hear a phantom noise, like a hiss or high frequency, and I'm not getting any of that. I'm hearing dead volume. Even if I have a song playing and I put the volume at 0%, I'm still not hearing any buzz or hiss. I'm gonna test it in my full review over a couple different types of headphones and see if I can reproduce that problem. But hopefully, LG and Google have done some improvements over the release. Now, I promised I would talk about the CPU GPU throttling, and I'm going to be testing right now on GL Benchmark, this is pretty much from cold boot. I haven't been, pl haven't been playing any games or anything like that. You can see how smooth this does. There's a lot of geometric shapes in there and a lot of advanced 3D graphic rendering, so it does very well. Now the question is, over time, if it heats up, it starts to slow down. So we're going to get a result from this, and then you will see, and I'll compare it to my Galaxy Note 2 as well. Off the bat, the Galaxy Note 2 is not as smooth. You can see plenty of frame drops and skipping. And there's some errors also popping up here and there where uh, pieces of the game start to disappear. The Adreno 320 really does not do that bad when it's not throttled with advanced 3D graphics. It's actually quite amazing. So Egypt HD Benchmark is meant as a theoretical test for advanced 3D gaming. You can see on the Galaxy Note 2, the Mali 400 MP4 GPU doesn't do very well. It only gets about 17 frames per second. That's for the advanced geometric shape fill rate. Now, looking at the Nexus 4, it's got 39 frames per second over the 17 frames per second from the... Galaxy Note 2. That's amazing. Now I've run this a couple times and after running it a couple times the sad thing is that it goes down pretty much by half. So this game emulation is about two minutes long and honestly look at that just after running it three times it has gone down to 25 frames per second. So they give you the Adreno 320 GPU which is awesome for 3D rendering and for gaming but then they have it throttle so I had ended up testing it a little bit on Need for Speed and it seemed to be all right. I had played it for about 10 minutes and I didn't see any real frame drops. I'm going to continue testing it over time, probably getting up to 40 minutes of gameplay and seeing in the real world how it ends up affecting frame rates in games. All phones have some type of throttling at one point, but this one just seems to throttle at such a low threshold. So very curious. I'll be testing that and also giving you my results. But just know if you're a heavy gamer, this may or may not be the best phone for you because it does have some issues. Also, if I find any way around the throttling, I will speak about that as well.
So thank you everybody for watching. This has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. I'm going to be doing a full review very soon on this. I want a chance to fully test it out. I can get into the camera and the battery life and even more in very, very much depth. But uh, hopefully you can see on a very preliminary or pretty much pretty decent in-depth level right now what you can expect from this device. So please rate, comment, and subscribe. And also, if you get to my main channel page, if you look at the right-hand side, there's a bar that has a bunch of links. You can follow me on Twitter. You can request to be my friend on Facebook. And I will add you, I promise. And you can also follow me on Google+, Plus or be my friend on Google+, Plus, whatever the heck you want to call that. You can ask me more questions about the Nexus 4. I'm going to really be testing this guy out and using it as my primary phone, probably on two different carriers to just get some kicks out of that. Also, if you're somebody who got your Nexus 4 back in November, please comment and tell me if you have seen any improvements with your device or anything like that, because there are some things that people are talking about with the speaker that I'm not seeing, and especially over earphones. I'm not seeing or hearing any weird frequencies, so I am very interested. So thank you, everybody, again, for watching. Have a good Happy New Year, and make good resolutions and such.